you do a, a, a website that's got, hey, it's got a picture of Jesus, therefore it's beautiful. No, especially when I reach the young people. They're used to slick videos, awesome production quality. They want slick marketing. And I'm not trying to yep. be fake or false. I mean, you go back, this is always where the church has been amazing. We pursue truth and beauty. You go back yep. into the, the centuries, look at these churches, look at the artwork. <laughs> exactly. These were the best marketers and designers of their time. They were the best architects and they were doing the commercials for God. Welcome to Beyond Damascus, the show where encounter meets mission. My name is Dan Dimite, and I am joined here today with Mr. Mike Pacer. How are you doing, Mike? Doing great, Dan. Awesome. Today, it's going to be a fun conversation, friends. It, get get ready to buckle up uh, and just hear a, an amazing testimony, uh, get some entrepreneurial excitement flowing through your blood, and then also have a little nice uh, seasonal Advent punch to the gut as well. So Mike is um, the the one of the founders of Five Stones, and it's a great multimedia production company. He'll talk about it. It's going to be really exciting. He'll explain it better than I just did. Um, but Mike's testimony is also pretty radical and amazing. Um, and he just rolled out a new book um, called The Three Comings of Christ. And so it's just going to be a great conversation about amazing testimony, the power of five stones and what they're doing for the church. And then also a nice Advent reflection on this book. I'm really excited. If you're joining us for the first time on Beyond Damascus, this is the show where encounter meets mission. And why is that so important? Because so often in the church, uh, people have an encounter with Jesus and then they sit on their hands. And there's nothing worse than that, where the encounter with Jesus should lead us into a life of mission. If we hear God speak to us in prayer, we should do something about that, right? When Paul encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus. He didn't sit around for um, years and years trying to figure out what does God want from me. He immediately heard the voice of the Lord and stepped into mission. So we're going to hear a story from Mike about how he almost had that same Paul experience. Mike, welcome to our show. Dan, you've set me up for complete failure. You've totally oversold me. <laughs> yeah, well, well, that's good. That's uh, it, it's nice to be humble, and, and um, but this is great. So, uh, I, you know what, honestly, Mike, I've been doing testimonies and interviewing people and their conversion experiences for years, and uh, uh, one of the lies in the church is that there's small testimonies. There's there's like no small testimony, right? Like Amen. any person who, who has encountered Jesus, yet like a lot of times people just haven't reflected enough on how significant that encounter was and what God was doing in those uh, throughout their life. And so Mike, how about for starters, we just start with your testimony. Like how sure. did you come to faith in Jesus Christ and how did he call you into a life of mission? Yeah, I uh, grew up, uh, you know, cradle Catholic, but you know, not one of these ones where I just, you know, went through the motions. My family was very devout. Uh, my dad and mom were, you know, daily mass goers for the most part. My dad was all the time. Um, my story is kind of like I never really ran away from the faith. I, you know, I don't have one of his fun stories about, you know, where I murdered eight people and started a brothel Man. and then came back. No, I, I was living a pretty good life. I joked that I ran away from God a lot of times on Friday and Saturday night in college, but would always come back Sunday morning and I'm sorry, God, and can you help yeah. me on the test on Monday? But yeah. uh, so I'm going along, get married, um, start raising kids. And uh, again, I'm doing all the right things. You know, I'm youngest person ever made a partner in my law firm, big Chicago law firm, litigation firm, a youngest guy ever made a managing partner of one of our Collar County offices. Uh, but on the other hand, I mean, I'm raising kids. I'm involved. I'm going to daily mass. I'm Laura and I are you know, involved in so many different things in the parish. And yet I'm living a life of duplicity in a lot of ways. And one respect, I'm Mr. Catholic, know my faith, study my faith, live my faith. On the other hand, I'm totally chasing, you know, what the world has to offer. I am becoming more and more full of myself, uh, more arrogant. Uh, you know, my country called membership was one of the most amazing things that I owned, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yet in spite of all this, God was humbling me because I started really becoming unhappy and from about 2000 to 2003, just realizing that, you know, I was fighting for a living and I wanted to kill 
you know, my opponent. And I wanted to figure out how my opponent was going to get me and I was going to get them first. And I was going to take them down and I was going to never, ever lose. And, and it was rough. It was really rough. So, you, so Mike, so you were, you were a daily communicant a, a, during this time as well. Yeah, a, a, absolutely. Absolutely. And wow. uh, I'm a tur- and an attorney. You, know, you wouldn't think that would be possible. Now I, I refer to myself, <laughs> I'm a recovering attorney these days. So. <laughs> so, so what kind of law did you do? And it was in Chicago for how long? Um, I was an attorney for about uh, 14 years. So wow. uh, I was a trial attorney. So civil law, not criminal, um, primarily defense, defense work. So, you know, specializing, the biggest specialties were uh, a lot of construction litigation and medical malpractice defense work. So I would uh, represent hospitals, doctors who were sued for alleged malpractice, um, general contractors who were sued for uh, alleged mistakes in the construction of a building. And then, you know, I did yeah. a smattering early on of uh, slip and falls, automobile accidents, things like that. Yeah. Was it hard to be, um, was virtue hard during that time? If like, as you described it, your goal was to destroy or to kill your opponent. Yeah. What Was a life of virtue and integrity difficult or not really? I don't know. It, it was a mixture of both. I mean, the reality is, especially in Chicago, when, when I was, you know, practicing law and going to law, I, probably 30, 40 percent of all the attorneys in Chicago were Catholic, at least, you know, actually maybe more than that. A uh, good number, you know, vast probably majority of judges were probably about 60 percent of the Catholic attorneys were, excuse me, attorneys were Catholic. Uh, so in some ways, virtue is great. But on the other hand, um, you know, especially when you start out, there's always that question about billing because the firm wants to bill a heck of a lot of hours. You only have Y number of hours in a day. So that was a little difficult. I wouldn't say that as where I was when I, kind of had my my big moment with so much of virtue of that. I think the virtue was arrogance. Uh, that was that was big. Uh, the virtue of charity, probably those two were the ones that were very difficult. It's hard. I would be friendly, but realistically, I wanted to win and I wanted to kill my opponent. It wasn't personal. Uh, it was ego. I want to win. Mm, mm. I'm not going to cheat. I'm not going to lie. But yeah, but it made me a very aggressive and happy person. So, uh, Mike, I don't, I don't know. I mean, maybe there's people who can empathize with what you're sharing, and they are um, a lay person, and they're 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 going to daily mass, or they're they're practicing their Catholic faith, and they're involved in the Knights of Columbus, or go to that man as you at their parish. Um, but then their their nine to five job, is, or, or maybe their nine to nine job Whatever, is, yeah. Is, yeah, is, is really cutthroat and intense and they're chasing the American dream. How, how did you, when you were going to daily mass and at the same time as you kind of expressed chasing the American dream and cared about your country club membership, what was, what was the Lord doing? How was he picking at your, your heart or your soul or yeah. nagging you at, at mass? <laughs> you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with, any job, so long as you're acting ethically and appropriately, you know, God wants great lawyers. God wants great um, construction workers, great teachers, great. You fill in the blank. God wants them. Amen. Amen. And, and anything you do is in a moment of counter. Anything is a place where you can live the faith. Anywhere is, you know, living the moment of of, of your faith is, is, is in your daily ordinary work. And I think especially the writings of San Jose Maria Escobar, you know, always talk about that. Every single opportunity in life is an opportunity to, to give God glory. But I do believe that, you know, you have to have an integrated life and you have to have a balanced life. The reality is we're supposed to work a certain amount. We're supposed to relax a certain amount. We're supposed to play a certain amount. We're supposed to laugh and have family time. And when those lines get blurred, that's a problem. So I think a lot of times it's kind of, well, what, what is your personality? What is your spirituality? And if you can live a good integrated life in a very intense, let's say you're an investment banker and you are working 70, 80 hours a week. If you can handle that, awesome. If you can't and you're doing it because I, you know, you, I want the world to look at me and, and admire me, eh, you might not be in the right profession. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, the call of the Catholic lady is so beautiful because uh, as you said, we like the Lord wants us to be a light in the world and 11 in the world. And, and so we need these great Catholics in every strata of humanity. At the same time, we have to be recklessly honest with ourselves. If I'm engaged in the world, am I, am I effectively being a light in the world or is the world starting to become part of my DNA? And, yeah. and, and how do, how do you, 
go through that. And, and that's the beauty about the Ignatian, like daily examination of conscience where I can daily examine myself at the end of the day and like, okay, like, was I effectively a light and was I a witness? And at the same time, did I allow the world to creep into my own heart or have I maintained hum humility, simplicity, um, and, and, and love for my neighbor? Amen. So, so what, what's the Lord doing? Yeah. In your so life I'm going at that time. along and then I'm just becoming really unhappy. It's kind of taken the, uh, I'm becoming unhappy. I'm becoming depressed, anxious, you know, really depressed. And I, I tried to figure it out, you know, and, and Lori was, my wife was becoming pretty, pretty um, unhappy as well because she saw my unhappiness. So yeah, I did all the things you're supposed to do. Uh, you know, I thought about it and I prayed about it a bit, you know, and I even journaled. I don't, I, if there's any guys listening, I, I actually didn't journal. That, I, that's, that's made up. I never journaled. Um, <laughs> so I, 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 I tried to come up and I couldn't come up with it. And at the same time, you know, Lori and I, there's really putting strain on our marriage because if you're really unhappy and you're waking up every day, and that doesn't mean every single day is terrible, but generally you're living this unhappiness, you're living this duplicity, you're living this point where you just don't think you're doing what God wants you to do. You, you can fake it for so long, but it's it's going to tear you up. And it was tearing yeah. me up. So Lori and I uh, found ourselves on a retreat. And it was a new parish retreat that uh, we, well, it was a a retreat that we were going to bring into our parish and our pastor asked us to go be the team that was going to receive it and, you know, be on the new team that would help lead it at our parish. And um, I went to it, you know, saying, okay, God, you, I really need to figure this out. You need to speak to me. And Lori at the same time went on, she was more cradle Catholic and just kind of going through the motions. It wasn't really like a real lived encounter experience in her life. It was something you do because it's the right thing to do. You, you go to church on Sundays, you go to Catholic schools, you raise your good Catholics. But she's like, why? Do I really believe this stuff? So our kids are starting to go through you know, First Communion. She's like, do I really believe this? So we both went in with a question. I asked God, you know, I don't, I don't think you want me to keep doing this law thing. What do you want me to do? Maybe work for the church, who knows? And Lori went in saying, okay, God, what are my gifts and how do you want me to use them to serve you? And so we're in the middle of the talk on the Holy Spirit, and we're not even sitting next to each other, and we both get knocked over. Uh, and I won't say, you know, got knocked off our horses, because as we all know, there's <laughs> nothing about the horse in the story on the road to Emmaus. You know, that comes from a <laughs> painting that was made years later, but that true just mowed over by God experience. And what hit me was Mr. Campbell, Mr study his faith, know his faith, you know. I had never once consciously prayed to the Holy Spirit in my entire life. Never. Wow. And I had three boys at the time, and I still do. Um, and I, it was like, to me, it felt like, like all of a sudden I woke up and I realized I had never talked to one of my, one of my three sons, just completely ignored oh. him. Now you can't really ignore, if you're talking to God, the Father or the Son, you are talking to the Holy Spirit. But there's such power to call upon the Holy Spirit. I was just missing yeah. out on this. And so I was wow. just knocked over, crying like a baby. Um, All right, Mike. No, it's like you guys, you guys, it was an allergy attack. I was not crying. Yeah. I was not yeah, crying. You, earlier, you weren't journaling. It was, no, I was not journaling and I was no. not crying. Let's and you were not crying, that. yeah. We can edit that out later, right, right Dan? Because yeah, yeah, really, yeah, we got that. Awesome. No, as long as awesome. you call it spiritual journaling, it's 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 okay. Oh, it's now all of a sudden, go. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's no longer a diary. Um, so it, it, what, when you say it was the first time you started to pray to the Holy Spirit or, or engage the Holy Spirit in prayer, what what was it? What was the prayer? Like, it, was what it, like? it wasn't even a prayer. It was just... Oh my gosh, the Holy Spirit exists. I've been saying the words okay. and he's yeah. real. He's real. Yeah. And the funny thing was at the same moment, Lori sitting in another part of the same room, not next to me, she all of a sudden feels the Holy Spirit complete indwelling. She describes it as liquid love. And the talk was yes. about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And what she heard God say to her was, Lori, these are your gifts. These are what I've given you. You've just chosen not to use them. So oh. she got liquid love. I got hit with the two by four because God is not fair. <laughs> that's it yeah you know the the we uh, we always say that the god of power is the same as the prince of peace <laughs> so it sounds like you got the god of power she was yeah. getting the prince of peace yeah but there <laughs> i got the awesome. whooping she got the liquid love so we yeah both, you probably deserve the whipping though so oh, heck yes in many yeah. ways in many ways so we both <laughs> left the room again paying no attention to each other i just knew i had to go to the chapel 
So mm. I'm in the chapel and I'm just having my moment. And it, you know, now I'm, I'm, I'm just calling, I don't even remember, but I was like, just talking to God, talking to the Holy Spirit. And I said, God, what do you want me to do? And I heard the words, like burning bush heard the words, just leave, just leave. And so I didn't know exactly what that meant yet, but I mean, it's pretty crazy. I mean, we have kind of thoughts. We have kind of um, insight that God wants something, you know, we'll see little God incidents in our life, but to physically, at least it's my perception of it was physically to hear the words of God was, was amazing. So I look up and, you know, I'm crying and I'm looking up through tear and eyes and I look over there and then there, there's a Rocky raccoon over there. Some woman with like running mascara all over the place <laughs> crying, you know, and she's looking up at me and all of a sudden it's Lori. She's, she didn't know I was there. I didn't know. She <laughs> was there. And, That's awesome. And just like, okay, <laughs> something, something big is going on here. So um, we went, this is the, here, here's the answer to the question about the prayer of the Holy Spirit. So we go back to the room we were staying in and Lori just, uh, he says, Mike, I want to pray over you. And she's, mm. she wasn't charismatic. I wasn't charismatic. I mean, you know, in fact, you know, I didn't even know charismatics necessarily were Catholic, you know? And so, you know, she put her hands uh, on my chest and started praying for, you know, and all of a sudden just like, I was just on fire burning up. So. Wow. 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 That's amazing. So she, so, so not only did she have the liquid love, but now all of a sudden she's, <laughs> she's giving yeah, the fire away. Out, baby, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. I love that. That's so good. I, I feel like so many people can probably, um, identify with that. Like, uh, I don't know why, but the Holy Spirit wasn't a part of the conversation no. in Catholic education or religious ed for so long. And, and if he was, it, it almost was, a he was presented like a, 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 a force or a power, not as a person. <laughs> and, and like, I, I, and so how do you pray to a power or a force or how do you pray to like a, a, or to a ghost, the Holy ghost. Yeah, yeah, ghost. exactly. You're afraid of a ghost? What are you talking about? Yeah, that's not creepy at all. No. <laughs> so, yeah, and so, so, did she, what was the Lord speaking to her at that moment? Was it consolation and love? Yeah, or? It was total consolation. The funny thing yeah. was, so Lori, these are your gifts. I mean, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and you just chose to use never to use them. Now, all she heard was the positive part of that. So it's funny. So I got hit. She got liquid with love. I got the you know, just leave. She got the, here's your gifts. And she only heard, oh, here's my gifts. I have so many gifts, blah, 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 blah. Well, it was about a year later, she kind of unpacked, yeah, but you never chose to use them. Like, ooh. <laughs> so yeah. God gives us what we need at the time. I needed to be yeah. shaken up. She needed to just be loved on. Later on, I needed the consolation of love and she needed to be shaken up. Yeah. So the Lord speaks to you guys, and uh, what do you do afterwards? Uh, do you do we nothing do exactly about it? exactly what Paul said. We, I just dropped everything and ran out, which is a total lie. No, what I did was for about eight, nine months, I analyzed the words, just leave. Yeah. Just leave. Yeah. Just leave. Now, does that mean just leave? Just, just leave. Just leave. <laughs> like, well, it's what just does that mean? Yeah, what does yeah, just do it. leave mean? Just do it like what's what's just in Greek, yeah, right? right exactly. <laughs> what's, the, what's the what's the Hebrew root? Yeah, so that's Lord, interesting. I I I like to say in uh, like Matthew chapter four, it says, you know, when Jesus says, "Come follow me," it says immediately they dropped their nets and followed him. And it's like the word immediately is in the Gospels all the time. The word gradually is never in the Gospels. Nope. Like pe people don't encounter Jesus and like, hmm. What should I do about this encounter? <laughs> right? It's just like, yeah. okay, I'm dropping the nets. I'm following him. All right. So you guys are meditating and reflecting months on the, and the months. She's yeah, just getting yeah. worse. And she's getting, Lori's getting so mad. At she figured it out pretty quickly what the heck it meant. She didn't like it, but she. That was she probably because it. she was a biblical scholar. Yeah. She, she just. Yeah, knew. no, exactly. I'm the biblical scholar and I don't know what it means. She's <laughs> yeah. just being honest with God. She knows what it means. Yeah. So we had all sorts of miracles. I mean, we had you know, just, there were just times we started, I mean, first, you know, we had this amazing thing. Okay. Things are going to be happening. Things are going to be happening. And I started looking, okay, God wants me to just leave. And now that meant, I mean, I'm going to leave, but leave and go where? And, yeah. and do what? And I keep looking for what it's going to happen, what we're going to do. And so month after month after month, nothing happens. And um, so Lori's getting pretty perturbed, you know, and um I remember it was the funniest thing. It was one week we were both reading like 
these, I can't remember what meditation we were reading, what, what devotional. And there was just like three days in a row where we like basically weren't even talking to each other. And every single one was just so speaking to us. And we're getting <laughs> ready to go out like on a Friday or Saturday night. And we're just getting ready. And I looked at her and I said, you know that med and I, like I didn't even say meditation. He goes, "Yeah, I know. I read it. I read it too." And just like <laughs> we're both like just see God speaking to us, and that we're dancing around and not doing it. So, mm -hmm. um, so fast forward, it's uh, getting near the end of the summer, and um, and all of a sudden, uh, we, I just have this this urge to I, somebody gave me this prayer, this novena prayer to uh, Saint Therese, and you know it's. Um, well, I want to say it. So we're out, we're out on, we're out on the gazebo one day and, um, we're, we're talking and, um, and, you know, we just, she stops and she goes, do you smell? Oh, no, wait a second. So we start talking we're like, we know what just leave means, don't you? And I finally said, yeah, it means I got to just leave. I actually have to just leave the lawn right now. And I can't share all the different, like, miracles that came up in those couple of days, you know, about that just made it so clear about a friend of mine, you know, kick literally kicking me in the butt, telling me that God, you know, I, God's showing you the way you just want to pick you up and carry you out the door, you know? <laughs> so we're sitting there, we finally come to it. We're on the same page. And Lori stops and says, do you smell that? I'm like, smell what? Did you smell that? And all of a sudden there's like this really strong smell. I said, yeah, I, what is that? And she says, it's roses. I'm like, you're right. And all of a sudden hit me. I just started praying this novena of the day, you know, oh, Therese, the child Jesus, pick for me a uh, heavenly rose and send it to me, you know, as a sign mm. of your love. Well, there were no roses on us, by the way. We had just planted yeah. roses that year. We didn't have a single bloom on the darn thing. So, <laughs> so again, so I decided I'm, I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to leave. And uh, I tried, I tried. At this point, I was, I had just left my original firm going with another firm. And so there was a managing partner uh, that I had to, you know, I had to quit my, my partnership and I couldn't get them. Couldn't, he was out of town, out of town, kept being delayed. Finally comes back in town. And um, of course it was the Feast of St. Therese. You know, it's like Therese didn't want me to until she made it clear. And at the moment that I'm resigning, you know, quitting my, my job, uh, resigning my partnership, Lori's driving in by the shop and she sees the statue. Literally was buying the statue of St. Therese from me at the exact same moment. So nice. There you go. <laughs> so it's, it takes a, a few different miracles to convince you, Mike, right? Quite, quite a few. Yeah. Quite a few. I'm That's not awesome. sure about half of them to be quite honest. Oh, so. I, I, I believe that. I believe that. And, and I think that's actually pretty normal. Like, um, I, I think in the same way that we haven't necessarily been taught to listen to the, the voice of the Holy Spirit in prayer, sometimes we have also been taught to almost question the voice of God yeah. in prayer, right? Where it's like, we've become very, and of course, scripture tells us to test every word we receive, but we, we almost become like defensive towards the word of God, as opposed to like children who are obedient to our father's voice. So what, when you're like, okay, I'm, I'm supposed to just leave now. What's the, what do you, what do you step into? What Two do you leave happen. into? First of all, yeah. to leave, what kept us from leaving was we had, we had, we both had blocks, because you're in your mid thirties, you've got a house, you've got a mortgage, you've got cars, you've got, you know, three sons whom you're hoping to send to uh, uh, Catholic high schools and um, good colleges. And you're like, well, how's this going to work? You know, you quit the law. You, I wasn't making tons and tons of money, but I was on a path to make a lot of money. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you do? So for me, it was the house. I had to give up the house. I had to, be willing to say, okay, we can't afford this house. And for Lori, interesting, it was the garden. She'd been working so hard. And when I say garden, we have like a, we have a wooded lot, just all sorts of different plants and shrubs and, and all these different things she'd been slowly working on. Started really with her father, really helping carve things out, and us all working on it together. And we had to both give those up and say, okay, God, they're yours. And if we gotta, we gotta, we gotta leave them. And I mean, I said, you know, God, want me to sell one of my boys? That's okay, let's do it. You know. And finally, at that point, that was a joke. You're supposed to, you're supposed to laugh a little bit there. So, <laughs> I'm geez. sorry. I was actually. Uh, it was. It was my. It was my timing. It was my timing. Uh, so, anyways, I, I, it was. I was actually in my own little contemplation. Like, <laughs> oh my gosh. Like, yeah, I was. I was thinking, Mike, about how it's so funny. Like something like selling your house, or it, it's such a significant thing, and so hard for us to give up. 
And at the same time, I was just reflecting, but compared to the glory of God, it's nothing. <laughs> like, like we, we make, we make these treasures on earth that seem so hard. And, and I'm, I'm empathizing with you because I like these worldly possessions, we make them so big. But compared to the beauty of God, it's like, this is dust. And, and, and the world allows it to become something it's not. And But yeah, okay, so you also had to sell one of your sons. I'm sorry, I missed that one. No, yeah. and you, and again, <laughs> but here's the joke. What does God really, he asks you to be willing. And he didn't take any of those things from us. He didn't take our son. He didn't take the house. Yeah, and he didn't, and he didn't take the garden. We're in the same house. And the garden's five times as, as, as pretty as it was then. Uh, mm. But he... You, you, you can't, you, this one took faith. This one took trust. You had to leave. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so what happened since then? I mean, just so many different things happened after that. So, um, you know, again, I didn't literally quit my job and, you know, mess up all my cases. I slowly worked my way out. And it was kind yeah. of funny because really the reality hit about, uh, about a month or two after I, you know, tended my resignation and said, okay, I'm going to, resignation and now I'm going to like wind down my cases, hand things off, et cetera. And all of a sudden hit and Lori's looking, you know, at the finances and she's, she tells God one morning, she goes, okay, you, you know, you, you've got, you've got a few months and we're going to be down to zero. You know, when this, when this whole thing, you know, when he's finished with uh, doing the law and she's really starting to get worried about it. So she invites her friends over. She's going to, we didn't really told them. They knew something was going on, but she's going to go have them over. It was like, I don't care. Remember, it was a weekday morning. And remember, I even quit yet completely. I mean, I told them I'm winding it down. I'm still getting a salary, you yeah. know, and she's like scared. She invites her friends over. She wants to get them to pray rose. She wants to come clean. She, she's scared. She's scared. She's scared. And all of a sudden this person we know walks up in the door and it's a friend of mine from the health club. And she hands Mike an envelope. Excuse me, she has a lawyer in envelope because I know Mike's been unhappy. I don't think he's supposed to be a lawyer anymore. He's probably supposed to do something in ministry or something in the church or whatever. And here's something to help. He probably needs another degree. And it's a check for twenty thousand. Wow. It's a check for twenty thousand dollars made out <laughs> in my name. By the way, this woman is an agnostic Jew. Wow. There you go. Praise the Lord. That's amazing. That is amazing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So uh, we start on a path. We you know, wind things up. I wind things down, I should say. I go out there. Uh, Lori and I ended up doing ministry work for years, um, working for that same retreat ministry and becoming the directors of that. And then we uh, we formed another ministry, Evangelize All Ministries, and did a, a one-day retreat. Because we're all, Lori and I are all about the Caribbean. We're all about the encounter moment. You know, you you got to meet Christ and Christ can work on an instant. But the great thing about a retreat, the great thing about that, you know, giving God some time is it's not that God can't work. It's we're not willing to listen to God. We're not willing to open up. Yeah. So the great thing about a well-crafted retreat is it breaks you down. It creates that moment of encounter and then it builds you up and tells you where to go from there. So, yeah. uh, so we did that for years. I uh, wrote my first book. Um, kept my law license up, of course, and you can be really busy when you're willing to work um, for various church organizations as a lawyer for free. So <laughs> I did a lot of legal work, a lot of business consulting, and then um, uh, brought me all the way to where I am now, brought me into helping out a lot with Lighthouse Catholic Media and being their corporate counsel and kind of uh, conciliere. And then ultimately, and maybe we'll get into this a little later during uh, the interview, uh, brought me to being what is now uh, the president of uh, Five Stones Group, as well as yeah. I went on to write a second book and now uh, a third book just recently, uh, The Three Comings of Christ. So That's great. I love that. Thanks so much, Mike. And I think, uh, you know, going back to that, that miracle of the $20,000 check, I think sometimes we wait to move until we get the miracle, but it's actually the movement that opens the door for the miracle. And, um, and I think that like, it, it was at what point did God say, okay, I'm going to send fire down on this, like for the prophet Elijah. It was probably when the prophet Elijah was pouring the water out on like, oh, okay, yeah, this guy, yeah. you know, he's pouring water. It's like, at this point, there is no hope for Elijah. He's going to, he's, his head's going to be cut off. And, and so everything he's a hundred percent dependent on God to move. And when we, when we live a life 
where there is no plan B, but we're a hundred percent dependent on God to move. Uh, it almost allows him to like, it gives him permission to like, let's do this Lord. And, and so often that's when the miracle comes. So why don't you tell our, our, our listeners about uh lighthouse and five stones and how that got started and sure. what the, what the hope and the vision behind that ministry apostolate is. Love to love to. So, and, and this is kind of funny too, because so Lori and I, you know, we're doing ministry work for years, you know, and, and kind of like the focus model where you go out and you get um, ministry partners to support you, you know, and it's very humbling. You know, it's one thing to be, you know, 20 something year old, uh, you know, kid out of Franciscan or wherever. And, you know, you're banging doors and saying, hey, I want to do ministry work for a couple of years. And people are like, oh, that's nice until you get a real job. Yeah. And nothing to be in your mid thirties with, you know, you know, three young men and saying, yeah, I, I want to do ministry work <laughs> and begging for your, for your, 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 your supper in, in a way. So um, very humbling. The interesting thing was, so I'm doing this, I'm, I'm involved in a lot of helping out with a lot of, you know, apostles, especially in Catholic media. And it wasn't until my last two guys were graduating from college that now God said, at a time when we're ready to go and live in a van down by the river, you know, because college is <laughs> over and all. Now God says, no, now I want you to go back into the corporate world. It's just crazy. You can't, you can't yeah. script this stuff. Yeah. So <laughs> Lighthouse Catholic Media, hopefully people will remember that. Um, it was a great organization started by uh, Mark Mindorf, who's now actually the president of uh, Ave Maria University. And uh, very simple beginning. The simple beginning was, let's take get these great talks by then little known people like Scott Hahn, you know, and uh, Jeff Cavins. Uh, and let's get them in the hands of, of Catholics. Let's have them start learning about their faith. And it's right about the same time the Catholic Answers is starting and a lot of the apologetics. And Mark's idea was brilliant. It was like, let's have these. Then it was, it was cassette tapes. You know, it was even before yep. CDs. <laughs> uh, and let's have them in the back of churches so people will grow themselves. And then when they hear this tape, they'll give it to somebody else and say, you've got to listen to this tape. It's awesome. Uh, so, you know, Mark started that and that grew into, you know, CDs and some books and all these kiosks in the back of churches and probably at least a third of the churches throughout the entire United States and this incredible support and sales, et cetera. And then, uh, Lighthouse started doing things with the Augustine Institute, which was originally just a, a grad school, but then started really wanting to make this content, but really had no distribution arm. So Mark and uh, Tim Gray were put together. Interestingly, they grew up within like a mile of each other, had all sorts of common friends and didn't even know each other. Same yeah. age, started their apostolates um, the same year, dedicated them on the same day and finally wow. got together. So and I, Tim Gray is the founder of Augustine Institute, correct? Exactly. For those who don't know him. Yep. Right. Dr. Tim That's Gray. That's awesome. So uh, we started – Determining, well, would it be a smart thing to to merge these two apostolates? And what we, after many, many months of um, prayer and discernment and talking with a lot of the, the leaders here, the real young leadership uh, that was at Lighthouse, was, okay, Lighthouse had built up all the support work, uh, programmers, full stack developers, uh, marketers, designers, customer service, and a warehouse. Well, let's not just put that at the service of Lighthouse slash Augustine Institute, let's put everything into the Augustine Institute and let's spin off this company as a separate company to support Catholic apostolates everywhere. So what people knew as Lighthouse went into the, uh, into the Augustine Institute and they slowly merged out that, that branding and now it's just all Augustine Institute and formed and a lot of the, the, the programs for parishes. And then we became what's now called Five Stones. So do you want me to share yeah. what Five Stones is? I, I love, the, I, I know what it is, but I love it. So I think you definitely should share share why you guys came up with that name. Okay. Um, so there's a story of David and Goliath, and David uh, goes over to the wadi before he takes on Goliath, and he picks up five smooth stones from the wadi, puts them in his satchel, and he pulls one out, he uses one against Goliath, and as we learn from the story, things do not go well for Goliath. And we have five smooth stones. We have five core services, warehouse and fulfillment, customer service, marketing, design, 
and uh, tech solutions. We also actually have, we, it's not a sixth stone, but we also uh, own Cedar House, which is this great opportunity to, to get awesome Catholic uh, product out into the marketplace and support all of our other clients. So we have these five smooth stones, these five stones um, that we, we say we use uh, on behalf of the church, and we're not the Davids of the world. The Davids of the world are the big guys, Ignatius Press, Augustine Institute, um, you know, real life Catholic, you know, uh, Christophonic, and, and small people too, just a scabbers.com, um, uh, what, what a funny one, leather makers, Catholic leather makers, O'Ray Moose. I mean, there's just all these great, you know, Catholic, and they're the Davids of the world. They're the ones that God has called to evangelize, to catechize, or to make something beautiful. And what we say is we're the stones in their hands that they use to slay the giants of ignorance, apathy, and apostasy. Mm-hmm. Amen. That's awesome. And I, you know, I think it's so interesting because a lot, I believe the Lord, um, ask a number of people to just leave and, and there's all these barriers and burdens as to why they don't do it. You know, there's certain people that they've been in the corporate world for a long time. They have these gifts, these talents that they're hungry to put at the service of the advancement of the kingdom and more of a full-time apostolic work. And they're like, ah, but I don't know how to do this, or I don't know how to do this, or I don't know how to do this. Or maybe they're not even in like, you know, maybe they're like, I don't even have many gifts and talents at all. You know, maybe they're like your wife where they actually have, you know, it sounds like Lori had all the gifts and talents the Lord wanted her to have, but she, she wasn't using them. Right. And I think, I think sometimes you just need those, you need those stones in your hand to say, no, I, I can do this. You Amen. need the faith. You need the faith of David. You need the anointing that David had and, and you need the stones. And, um, and we all have the anointing already. Boom. That was given to us at our baptism. So check, right? The, the faith comes in, in, in our time of prayer and it comes from trusting in the word of God. And then you do, you just need those, those, the, you don't need a ton. You don't need like he, like, you know, Goliath had the spear and javelin. You don't need that. You just need stones, right. <laughs> but like you do need those things to help you advance the kingdom. And you guys are there to serve the, the broader church, which is beautiful. We're there to pretty much do um, any of the business services a Catholic organization uh, needs. Now, what I want to share about organizations is a little bit different than most is that, you know, we'll, we'll compete and, and give the type of work that a, a secular marketing, you know, agency can do. But what separates us is, you know, we've answered the questions. We don't exist to do marketing or to do design or to have a great, you know, Catholic maker store in Cedar House. We exist to promote an encounter with Jesus Christ in ourselves, in those, in each other where we work, and then in our customers, clients, et cetera. But the first thing yeah. is about promoting the encounter by ourselves in every day. And everybody has that by their, everyone has it by their desk. That's why we exist. Everyone constantly looks yep. at this, this beautiful little you know, four-question sheet that everyone's got by them saying, why do we exist? We exist to promote an encounter with Jesus Christ yep. and ourselves in each other. And what we have here is we have a, in our offices, we actually have a beautiful chapel. Uh, it'll fit about 75 people. And uh, our Lord is present. And every one of our employees is invited, not made, but invited to pray the rosary at 830. Our Lord is exposed from two o'clock to three o'clock and they can do 10 minute adoration spots. Three o'clock, we do um, Divine Mercy Chaplet. Uh, we have a priest come in once a week, do mass, and we do solemn benediction on uh, Fridays. Yeah, wow, so there you go. <laughs> so you, and, and this is beautiful because it's it's literally weaved into the fabric yes. of your, and, and you're not, um, I, what I've learned about Five Stones too is it, it functions in many ways as a business, but you're providing faith formation for those who are there. And I think so often, even sometimes you don't just have to leave, right? Like as I think I've been trying to challenge Catholic lay people to start thinking, okay, if, if God has given me a business or if God has given me leadership over an organization or over a company, how can I allow people to encounter the Lord in the, in the framework that the Lord's already given me, right? I don't always have to leave corporate America to do something else in the church. No. Actually through the Holy spirit, 
I can, I can allow people to encounter him at work. And I, I mean, if it's, if it's a private company, you get to make up what you want for your employees. <laughs> like right. you set the culture. And so you, and that you've done that. You've created a culture. You've created a, a um, uh, basically a, a framework that your employees can enter into prayer throughout the week, which is pretty fantastic. It's all about integration. It's all about living that, that life of, um, where it, it, it's not kind of like a business. This is a business. We run this with, we're always challenging ourselves to use the best principles of business, you know, yep. and we're, we're challenging ourselves. We're always trying to be state of the art in everything we do. We just put in, I won't tell you how much money, we just put in a huge amount of automation into our warehouse because in this day and age, you just can't gear up for the, the amount of work that you need to do October through December, you can't do it with temporary labor, labor anymore. We used to yep. hire more than double our warehouse staff uh, to come in and work during those months. You can't do it. You just can't, you can't train. You can't get the number of people. So we have to have state-of-the-art automation, and we have it. You have to have yeah. it. Gone are the days that we're going to have a website or we're going to have video. You know this. What are you doing? You're, you're professional. You're awesome. The work you're doing is amazing. It's not we're going to sit on a tin can and speak into a, you know, a, a little uh, soaped wire. We're not going to do a, a, a website that's got, hey, it's got a picture of Jesus. Therefore, it's beautiful. No, especially when I reach the young people. They're used to slick videos, awesome production quality. They want slick marketing. And I'm not trying to yep. be fake or false. I mean, you go back. This is always where the church has been amazing. We pursue truth and beauty. You go back yep. into the, the centuries. Look at these churches. Look at the artwork. <laughs> exactly. These were the best marketers and designers of their time. They were the best architects. And they were doing the commercials for God and out mm -hmm. of love for mm -hmm. God. Well, we're doing it with graphic arts. Yeah. We're doing it with marketing. We're doing it with, you know, code uh, and programming. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I love that. I've actually never heard someone compare it, which is it's such a, a true statement, the the beauty of the Sistine Chapel to striving to do excellence in ministry today. Because I think sometimes there is that poverty mindset that we can enter into oh. where it's like, oh, oh, no, like we should just be very simple and we shouldn't strive. But no, I mean, the church wanted to be excellent in everything. AMDG, right? All for the greater glory of God. And how can we strive to be excellent in absolutely everything we do. And and quite honestly, I don't think that makes us dependent on ourselves, right? Like we always say we want to work like everything's dependent on us, but pray like everything's dependent on God because it's a partnership. And he says, I want you to, I want to co-labor with you, which means I have to labor. And if I'm going to labor, I want to do a good job at my laboring. That's I've heard people uh, flip I, that one around. Why don't you work like it actually all depends on God? Not like it depends on yourself. You depend on yourself. Guess what? You're dead. If you work like it depends yeah, on yeah. God, what is God going to ask you to do? God's going to ask you to give your all to him. Yeah. And God's going to yep. say, don't worry, you work. It's going to happen. Our, yep. our Protestant brothers and sisters, I've heard it more from them than, than us, but they ask that question, how big is your God? We, we, our God's, our God is so small to us most of the time. Oh, God couldn't give me $100. Oh, God couldn't figure out a way that we could get a new program. Oh, God couldn't figure out a way that we can compete with state-of-the-art uh, warehouse. Yes, God can. God, the Lord, yeah. you know, creator of all things, can do everything. We're the ones that tell God what he can't do. Yeah. Yeah. Very small minded. So often uh, it's such a true statement. And I, I think too, we even almost compete with each other as, as if, um, as if God doesn't want abundance for us, right? Mm -hmm. Like these nonprofits and you see it all the time. You see parishes competing with each other. Oh, you see these yeah. Catholic apostles competing and it drives me nuts because it's like, wait, like uh, we were just having a conversation, uh, uh, this past week, like, well, maybe we shouldn't go there because we don't want to step on the toes of someone else who's doing young adult ministry there. I'm like, are you kidding me? There's like 30,000 young adults there. I don't think we're going to deplete the young adult outreach in that area. Like th there's an absolute need for us not to see ourselves in competition, but in completion. And I think you really do that well at Five Stones. Dan, you just you hit one of the things we, we tell everybody. I, I saw that so much in ministry. Well, they take your program and they're not going to take mine. We're competing for 5% market share. This is silly. I've always said this, you know, <laughs> let's all just do it together. And when there's three people left in the entire world that don't love Jesus Christ, we can fight over those three. 
Until then, we have the work cut out for us, you know? Uh, yeah. And that's what we say, you know, to all these, sometimes it's a little strange for some of these companies, you know, like, well, wait a second, but you're working for our competitor. You're using your warehouse for them and your marketing skills. And we're like, yeah, and we're getting better because yeah. of it. And we're going to use, uh, you know, the old saying, you know, when the harbor rises, all ships rise. We're going to use yep. this for everybody and all the benefits that we can by bringing you all together and, and getting, you know, the um, economies of scale and getting us better at everything we do. We're going to use it on behalf of all of you. And there's yep. plenty of souls out there to reach. Yep. You don't have to worry about it. Absolutely. MP. Yep. Yep. Amen. Amen. All right, Mike, I feel like we should definitely move on to the conversation about your, your newest book. So, um, it's the three comings of, of Christ. And this comes from Bernard of Clairvaux, right? A, mm -hmm. a meditation from him. Why don't you share kind of, uh, what are the three comings of Christ? Uh, who, who St. Bernard of Clairvaux is and why you chose to write this book? Well, now I've got to, you know, I've got to correct you because I've always been told it's actually Bernard of Clairvaux, but I'm going to go oh, with Bernard. Okay, yeah. Bernard. Yeah. Oh, you, but, can do, you, you can go for that. So, you know, unfortunately, Advent is a lost season. We, you know, Black Friday comes, maybe we wait that long, and all of a sudden it's Christmas. Uh, the funny thing is, you know, even though we look at Christmas as, well, what, what is Christmas all about? We say, well, it's the birth of Christ. I'm going to ask you the question, what, what's that all about? Why? Yep. Why did God become man. Why was Jesus born in a stable 2,000 years ago? And Advent is the reason, the explanation, and the context for, for Christmas. And during Advent, the church invites us to, to not focus on just one coming of Christ. The church always talked about two, and St. Bernard Claveau really made it a little clear and said, really during Advent, we're supposed to focus on three comings of Christ. So the first one is the coming of Christ 2,000 years ago. But why? We should enter into um, a study of salvation history all the way from the, the uh, creation through all the stories of the patriarchs and the kings and the prophets and the judges. What's going on? God is always promising the Messiah. God, from the very first moment where we broke our relationship, we get the proto-evangelium and saying, don't worry about it. I'm yep. going to send the seed of the woman and he's going to strike the heck out of the serpent's head. <laughs> We're going to win. God promises this all, right away. And throughout all the stories of the, of the patriarchs, of the prophets, of the kings, there's always the sense of the Messiah is coming, this longing. So, and, and all these things, like why, was, why was he born in Bethlehem? Why was he born to a virgin? Why was he born in the lineage of David? This is all spoken about. This is all precursed by stories of the Old Testament. So don't just think about little eight pound, six ounce baby Jesus born with no shoes on his feet. <laughs> yeah. You know, in the manger, let's enter into the whole history of mankind awaiting, longing for this. Um, yeah. So that's yeah. the first coming of Christ. But in context, and the second coming of Christ is, well, Christ didn't just come and then take off. Christ said, I'm coming again. And he's yeah. going to come at the end of time. And one of three things is going to happen. You know, he's going he's to stand before us. And we're going to be judged. And you can look at a lot of our ways what that means. You know, it can be God's going to judge us or judge. God's going to say, okay, how'd you do? You know, when I was hungry, when I was thirsty, you know, what, what, what did you do? Did you love me? Did you love God? Did you love your neighbor? And what other things going to happen? Heaven, awesome. Purgatory, not as awesome, but still totally awesome. Hell, yeah. not, <laughs> not awesome at all. And no. that's the context we have to live our life, not out of fear, not out of a morbid curiosity, but we're, we have no abiding city here. You talked about, about letting go because God has so much more. And God at the end of time has all perfection, all family, all joy, all completion, all everything for us. So that's the second coming of Christ. But the third coming of Christ is what your show is all about. It's not a history lesson of what happened 2,000 years ago. It's not some theoretical thing about, well, at the end of our life. God comes at every moment of every second, and he wants to be in our hearts, and he wants to enter into our lives. Every moment is the moment of encounter. Every moment is the time to say yes. Every moment is to say, come, Lord Jesus, come right now. And what mm -hmm. you learn from the great spiritual masters and I personally think C.S. Lewis, the Screwtape Letters, is one of the best. 
is what the devil does is he's always tempting you, always tries to get you to regret, live in the regrets of the past or the glories or to fear the future and never live in the moment because that's the only place where God exists. God is. I am who I am. Now is where we meet God. God's not in the past. God's not in the future. He's now. And that's where God comes to us right now. So then the third coming of Christ is uh, it's what your show is all about. It's, it's about that encounter, encounter moment because we don't want to look back just at like a historical event. We don't want to look just about some musing about the future. God comes to us every moment of every day. Every moment is the, the moment of counter. Every the moment yeah. is the time where God says, I want to come into your heart. I want to come to your life. I want to be everything to you. And, you know, one thing, I, a lot of spiritual masters talk about living in the present moment. And one of my favorite is uh, C.S. Lewis and the Screw Tape Letters. There's this little play back and forth where, you know, the lead dementor is telling, you know, the, uh, the little apprentice saying, hey, look, whatever you do, you know, get, get your, your human to live regretfully in the past or to worry hmm. about the future, but never let them live in the moment. And that's because that's where God lives. God is, I am who I am right now is the most important moment of all times. And yeah. your next now will be and your next now will be. So yeah. that's the third coming of Christ is no matter Amen. what you're doing, this is where you invite Christ into your life. Well, and I think it's almost the meditation of the the past and the meditation of the future that allows you to right size your expectations for the God of the present, right? That like, if I understand that what God did yesterday in the church it, it is what God wants to do today in the church, then I have expectation where I feel like so often we're like, we, we read the scriptures as if these, these are like Bible stories that weren't actually real, like, or that, that, that it's a God that he used to do that, but he doesn't want to do that today. And it's like, no, no, no. What I read about on Sunday in the God gospel is the same God that I encounter when I go into prayer or the God of Mount Sinai with peals of thunder and flashes of lightning. Oh my goodness. When I go into adoration, there he is and in the same power and majesty and, and glory and I can worship him. And then to understand who you are in the future and who, where I will be in the future when I know that there will be a second coming and, and all, all of this is for naught because all will come under the just judgment of God. It allows, I, I don't, you just fall on your knees in the present moment and you know who God is and you, you encounter not a wimpy passive God who's like tells you go and be nice to everyone, but you can encounter the God of Sinai, the, the God of Nazareth, the God of Bethlehem and, and the God of Revelation all in your prayer today, which That's is right. pretty exciting. That's right. Pretty doggone exciting. How, how have you seen the this book? And, and I'm sure it's a new release, but how have you seen this messaging really impact people's lives? You know, the way I, I do it is I, I go through, I picked out the, the seminal moments of salvation history from creation all the way to the birth of Christ. And I went through three different uh, meditations. The first meditation is, okay, how did all that point to the first coming of Christ? And, you know, all of these, these types of Christ that existed throughout. Then the second is, you know, okay, well, let's read these in light of Christ's coming again. And the third is, how do we invite Christ into our heart? Now, I think these meditations are awesome. You know, I have to say that. I wrote it. But, <laughs> and my mom really likes it too. So, you know, oh, okay. Oh, geez, that's, that's impressive. That's my 92 year old mother says, buy the book. All right. <laughs> she so, was my first Amazon review <laughs> <laughs> and she gave me four stars. Right. So <laughs> she actually doesn't know how to buy from Amazon, but yeah, had okay. she, she would have. Um, but I think if nothing else, if people or families would go through from December 1st to December 24th, just reading that's the story that I laid out, the reading each of the different passages. You'll, that's what we did when I, when I was a kid. My family, we did this every single night. We, we, after dinner, we'd go and open up what the traditional Advent calendar, which was about going through these different readings, not the jelly of the day or the chocolate of the day oh. or the bourbon Advent calendar. Yeah. Okay, that one I was thinking about buying for myself, I got to admit. Yeah. Uh, I mean <laughs> But, so so much for Advent being a penitential season. <laughs> it's just, but it's amazing, you know. But so uh -huh. if, if we if we if you would do this, one of the things that would happen 
would be something that most of us don't know. And that is the Old Testament would become real to us. I have heard these stories every year throughout my entire life, plus hearing them at the reading or hearing them in mass, where the stories of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, they're more real to me than the stories of my great, great grandfather. Uh, you know, I've heard a couple stories about him or my great grandmother or this yeah. person was over in Germany or in Poland or whatever. But these yeah. stories I've read every single year. And if nothing yeah. else, I would just ask people, do that. Bring the Old, the old mm. Testament. We have this concept. We don't read the Old Testament that this mean, old, spiteful God. It's not true. The Old Testament is a love story. It's a story of God loved us so much. He loved so much that he created us in that love to share in his love. And we kept running away. We kept breaking our relationship. And God just kept running back, wooing us, getting us back. Yeah. And then we'd come back and then we'd run away again. And he'd start the process over and over again. Him wooing, us coming back. We don't need him anymore because things are going great. That's the story. The story yeah. is an absolute amazing I love story. It. Oh, and I, I just, it's, it's this, this, it's a story of hunger too. And I think yeah. we can become like the church isn't hungry enough anymore, but you look to our, our Jewish roots and it was a people that were longing, longing. and longing, longing and longing for the Messiah. Amen. And, and I imagine how beautiful it would have been to hear Jesus say like, the time has come, yeah. <laughs> like, like the kingdom of God is at hand, like all of these centuries and decades and thousands of years of waiting. Now the kingdom is at hand and it, to live from that reality and, and that Advent is this wild, crazy experience where I get to enter into that like multi thousand year longing of Israel. Yep. Yep. And then in that moment experience the, the here now coming of Christ and uh, that the kingdom is at hand and, and that that actually Advent becomes a spiritual ground. Advent and Christmas becomes a spiritual practice for what my daily prayer life should look like that yep. I should come to the Lord with longing and fulfillment, longing and fulfillment, longing and fulfillment. And it's, it's there where the power of God is manifest in our lives. You know, I was, I was praying this past week and um, I was like, all right, Lord, I, I want to make Advent this year, like an intense season, right? Like uh, there's like, we wear purple for a reason and, and we wear purple, for, like not to allow Advent to become like our like four week preparation uh, uh for the real gluttony feast of Christmas, but it's like, it's I, like, like, no, it's, it's a penitential season where I want to, I, I'm, I want to enter into a time of intense fasting so that my body actually longs for Christmas, for the coming of Christ. I want, I want a season of intense longing and prayer that I would actually seek him more. And I don't know for our listeners, if, if I, I our church has done such a good job, eh, we, uh, we, we know that we're supposed to seek him with all of our heart during Lent. I don't think we know in America that we're supposed to seek him with all of our heart in Advent. And it, go, go I, I'm with you. I, I don't think, I think you're right, but I'm going to suggest something that sounds a little crazy. I yeah. think it's very tough because let's face it, as of, you know, Black Friday at the latest, you know, everything is Christmas and there's parties yeah. everywhere and you're, you're invited to parties and you, you should go to them. You're your office party. A lot of people that can't together, can't get together on Christmas. So different parts of the family meet the week before. So that's fine. But here's the thing. Why don't you use it all? You know, I, what I, I like to use the phrase hijack the hype and use it all yep. for Christ. So every time you hear, you know, you walk into a store and you hear the Christmas music, turn to prayer. Every time you see the Christmas lights, turn to prayer. And I'm not talking about drop down your knees and say, you know, 10,000 Our Fathers. How about every time, you know, you just see, you hear this song or that, or, or, or see those lights, say, come Lord Jesus, come Lord Jesus into my heart, you know, yeah. and use all these things to remind you that you're in this season of Advent and, and use the lights, the decorations, the food, all these things. And when you're at the party, you can have a great time. Go have a great time. But you know what? How about even more than the food? Fasting is great. How about fasting from, from gossip? How about fasting from complete gluttony? How about going in to the tough 
parties you're going to be at, the ones at work that maybe don't like everybody, or that part of the family is pretty tough to deal with, and say, I'm going to be the peacemaker. I'm going to be the person who loves on everybody in this room and to prepare yourself before you go into that party. Mm -hmm. And sure, have a couple glasses of wine, have some nice food, you know, at that moment. But say, you know what, more than anything, I'm going to, I'm going to be Jesus Christ to everybody at this party. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I, I think the important thing is being intentional, right? Amen. All of those things like that, that we would uh, allow Advent to be a very intentional season, just like um, we allow Lent to be a very intentional season. Yeah. And I, I'm excited. I mean, the Lord says, if you seek me with all of your heart, you, you will find me and I will change you. And I think uh, if we seek him with all of our heart during the Advent season, uh, not only will we find him, but he will transform us. He will change us. And the beauty is he changes us into himself. <laughs> it's like, uh, right. it's so good. Um, okay. Well, one amazing way to be intentional is to uh, check out your book and um, where, where can people find yeah. the three companies of Christ? I'm going to do a little, uh, I'm going to do a little commercial for Cedar house. Do it. So normal spelling, all one word, cedarhouse.co, C-O, not com. And this ties into our whole, we, we, we own this as well. And this ties into our whole Davidic, you know, where remember David, like is staring at this, you know, he's sitting, Cedar's the greatest. Cedar's the, the best building material, the most beautiful. He's sitting in this house of Cedar's like, God, you're still in a tent. You know, I want to build a house of cedar for you. And, yeah. you know, the prophet Nathan, you know, comes back to him after first saying yes. Now God says, no, 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 no. And he knows that, you know, David can be prone to, to pride. And he's like, I've given you everything. So you're not going to build the house of cedar. Your son's going to. And realistically, his son, 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 because it's Jesus who's going to build the eternal house of cedar, the house, you know, the tabernacle being everywhere, the new house that all of the Gentiles, all of everybody is welcomed into. Yeah. So we Amen. named this. So what we do is we promote all sorts of large and small Catholic makers uh, mm. under Cedar House. Uh, and what we try to do is from simple people who are, you know, doing, you know, just some you know, rosaries or scapulars or artwork to uh, so many um, sisters and brothers and priests that are you know, doing monastery goods to help you know, support their community. We put those, all these are the Davids, and we put them under the house of Cedar and, and we promote their, their products. So obviously you can get my book anywhere. You can get it uh, at the Evil Empire slash Amazon, but you know, <laughs> uh, but I'm gonna, gonna do a plug and I'm gonna do a plug again for Christmas too. You know, you wanna buy some great intentional you talk about intentionality. How about you can go buy, you know, G.I. Joe with the Kung Fu grip um, or you can buy, especially people that are hard to purchase for your mom, your dad, your aunts, uncles. Why not go buy them some candy from Trepstein Monastery or uh, Peanut Brother, uh, you know, the uh, St. Mine Red Monks making just phenomenal organic peanut butter uh, or so, just so many wonderful things. Why not buy these gifts that, first of all, you're supporting uh, a Catholic maker or a or a monastery. Number two, when you give it to someone on your list, they feel really good about this, you know? And another thing is too, we have so much stuff. I'm kind of a big believer in buying the honey, the jellies, the candies, because we eat it, we enjoy it. We know we're doing a great thing. We're supporting a religious community. And then it goes yep. away. It's not cluttering our house anymore. <laughs> so I yeah. do a, yeah, cedarhouse.co would be a great place to buy my book and to also buy, you know, just wonderful things for, uh, for the Christmas season. You heard it here, friends. What a great commercial. That was awesome, Mike. I do. I think uh, we've got to support those, uh, especially the religious communities. It's so beautiful that they're, oh man, yeah. It's, uh, it's a great opportunity to bless them and to bless their apostolate of prayer ministry before the throne, which is so good. Um, Mike, what is your prayer for Advent this year? Or, or is there anything else you want to share with, with our listeners before we wrap yeah. up? My prayer and what I'm going to try to do it, we, we pray before almost basically every meeting here. And it just kind of came to me today. We do a lot of free form prayer. But, you know, I'm going to start promoting the ones that I'm leading with uh, my leadership team and other people. Maybe just a little silence. There's so much mm -hmm. noise this time of year. And I think we talk too much sometimes in prayer. We don't listen. And I think Advent, you know, you talked about intentionality. You talked about, you know, fasting. But one of the reasons, you know, we fast is we don't just fast for the sake of, look at me, I'm tough. I can fast. We fast from things so God will fill us with better things. 
And I think a very important thing to be intentional is all of our words and all of our talking. And I think, especially all those of us in the Northern Hemisphere, you know, winter, you know, December, as we go from fall into winter, is a time that is so beautiful for to entering into quietness. And so what a great way to prepare. So I'm going to do this yeah. and I challenge everybody who's, who's experiencing this podcast. Why not try to enter into silence not just sounds for the sake of Amen. Sounds, yeah, I to totally listen to what God agree. Has to say. Um, Mike, I just want to say thank you so much for being on our show today. Uh, I want to encourage people make uh, this Advent very intentional and allow the Lord to speak to your heart and to transform your life. Let's just close in prayer in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come Holy Spirit, I just pray the abundance of grace that is available to us during the Advent season to be present in our lives this Advent. Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would allow us to enter into that thousand year longing of the Israelites awaiting the Messiah. And Jesus, I just pray that you would come into our lives here and now as Messiah, as Savior, as the anointed one who has come to transform our lives and to save us from sin and death in darkness. I believe that I'm just getting a word right now that uh, this is a new season for you personally in your life. There's, that the Lord wants to anoint us this season um, to free us from sin and death. And the, the darkness that has been in your life, the Lord is going to use this time of grace to free us from that. So Lord, come as Messiah, come as Savior, come with your power and your glory and your beauty. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You've been listening to Beyond Damascus, the show where encounter meets mission. Uh, I, I pray that this episode has blessed you. And if it has, please like, share, subscribe, comment, whatever you're supposed to do. Uh, but most importantly, uh, tell others about this episode so that they also prepare their hearts for this Advent season. And so that people can see that right now is the time that Christ is present and they can encounter him. Thanks so much and join us next time on Beyond Damascus.